<laughs> during the Ooh, how exciting. Okay, so welcome. My name is Nina Jane. As I said, I'm the director of the library, and I'm so happy to have this program here because I am, as we all are, big advocates for literacy and writing and readers. So we wanted to really make a splash for Nina Rimo. So we're really excited to do this. So um, first of all, I'd like to thank the Friends of the Library who support all of our adult programming. We couldn't do this without them. And um, you for being here and for all of your work that you do to, um, to you know, use the library and um, make it a vibrant part of the community. So I would like to introduce Alicia Gregor. Gregor, right? Gregor. <laughs> yes, okay. Who is here to talk about um, starting your past for NaNoWriMo, which is, as you know, um, November, where we try to write 50,000 words, just like get it out there. And she's going to say, talk about how to get on that path, how to prepare for it, because of course it'll start on Monday, although I'm sure you write every day. So without further ado, I hand it over to Alicia, who's going to talk a little bit about herself and what she's going to be doing today. Hi, everybody, and welcome um, to writing a novel in a month, how to prepare yourself for NaNoWriMo. My name is Alicia Gregoire, and I'm your host for today, as Mina said. Thank you so much, Mina, for having me here. Um, sorry, I can't make it in person. As I mentioned, my daughter's sick, and we're just trying to be safe for everyone. All right, so who am I? I um, Right, right now, writing is, I guess you would consider my side hustle because I do work full time and at doing something entirely different. Um, but I do have over 20 years of writing experience under my belt across multiple genres. Um, and I do all of it um, in the wee hours of the morning um, when I should be sleeping. Um, I'm a board member of the Writer's Loft, which recently relocated to Hudson, Mass. And I am also um, an executive committee member for the Boston region of NaNoWriMo. Because that region is so large, the MLs have um, tapped a couple of regulars to help out. Um, I write young adult contemporary. I write new adult romance, crossover fantasy, and humorous how-to guides. Um, my most recent book out is um, The Flippant Girl's Guide to NaNoWriMo Success called November Again, and it's exclusively available on Amazon. Um, you can get a paperback or get an ebook. And if you belong to KU, you can get it, you can get it for free. See, there's some chatting. Okay, that was just telling Erin to unmute herself if she wants. All right. All right, today we're going to cover just high level what is NaNoWriMo in case this is new to you guys, how to come up with a kick ass idea and finding and making time to write. Um, specifically for November, but this can be used across the board. Just want to make sure you guys can hear me loud and clear. Yep. Yes. Excellent. If at any time I'm going too slow, too fast, feel free to let me know. I don't have the, the thumbnail on because I don't want to block up any of this, the slides. So just shout out stuff if needed, okay? Okay. okay. All right. So is anyone unfamiliar with National Novel Writing Month? Yes. yes. Okay. So, you know, a quick look for what we're going to be looking at in a few days time is you need to, in order to win by NaNoWriMo logic, you need to have 50,000 words on a novel in one month, either fiction or nonfiction, though to be, if you're a traditionalist, it is fiction and it is a new work. Um, the founder, Chris Beatty, tip, like, focuses more on the creativity, the camaraderie, and the community of writing the novel in a month's time with other individuals around you supporting you. Um, you know, more dedicated writers kind of use it as just part of getting something out faster or working through something. Um, but in a traditional sense, it's more focused on 
the creativity and the impulsivity of creativity and the like. Um, traditionally, it's held in November for the entire month. There are two Camp NaNoWriMo's during the course of the year, which um, you can set your own goals. It can be revising, writing. It can be 20,000 words. It can be 100,000 words. Those ones are totally up to you. Any questions? Can I, can I interrupt for a second? Yes. Um, I changed the view to just have the PowerPoint. Do you, would, would you prefer Alicia's face on the side? Doesn't matter? Okay. And as she was saying, feel free to raise your hand. She can see you. So if you raise your hand, she'll know that you have a question. Sorry, go ahead. I don't think she can see us because she turned the thumbnail off. I can put her. the thumbnail down if that's not going to bother you guys. Either way. All right. We, we can play show. <laughs> or I can call on people too. All right. I feel a little better seeing the thumbnail. I don't feel like I'm talking into a void. Um, okay. All right. So the key to doing NaNoWriMo and achieving the 50,000 words where it's has some kind of cohesion and some kind of sense to it is preparing the novel ahead of time, coming up with an idea, having a character and knowing those story milestones. And I'm talking like thinking back to like English class and the, and the plot diagrams, like knowing those key points. Um, those things will help you get your novel underway and you'll give have less pain during the month of November. Um, I have done, this is now my 12th one, I think. And I have prepped every single one. Camp NaNoWriMo's, maybe not so much, and those go a little rougher. Um, I start, my first one, I started literally planning everything by the letter, um, really anal retentive notes, and I got it done. Um, I made my 50K by November 30th. I finished my novel um, a week later at 65,000 words. Um, and then I got a little looser as I was more comfortable with preparing, with, with pre-writing and not pantsy my way through my writer's life, which is what I was doing before. I had actually started NaNoWriMo um, doing it as a way to get out of the never ending revision cycle. I was working on the same book for a really ridiculous amount of time. Um, I would write it, I'd revise it, I'd send it out for queries when I was convinced it was ready and I would get form rejection after form rejection after form rejection, and it just kept going and going. And I needed to get off of that wheel because I was not being productive with anything. Um, now I have a really extensive body of work that I'm working my way through to get published. Um, so yeah, so the first thing is we need to come up with a kick-ass idea. Um, you need to have an idea that's really going to ignite you. Um, to be able to write for a month straight on it. Um, does anyone have an idea of what they're writing? No. Okay. <laughs> I've had an outline for several years now, and I've only written like one page. <laughs> okay. Okay. You've got to start somewhere, and maybe it need maybe you need to have some tweaks in it, and that's what this workshop's going to help you with too. So a lot of times it's like, oh, where am I going to come up with an idea? I have no clue because it, it's not like, like if you sit down and like today I'm going to brainstorm ideas, it's just going to kind of like keep you stuck because it's a kind of a overwhelming concept to come up with something from nothing. But as writers, you can get ideas from anywhere. It's everywhere. It's in current events. It's in some trending internet meme. Fan fiction is a favorite during NaNoWriMo. Um, a lot of 
participants that I know do write fan fiction and that's their their jam. Fairy real fairy tale retellings are also good. You can like take a fairy tale and then twist it so it has a modern bent, a gender a gender bent gender bending, um, put it in a different type of universe. You could, you could just take a basic idea and build from it. Um, rhetorical questions, songs, all these kinds of things are places you could jump from. Um, I've used with students in the past, like giving them like quiz, like pick visual cues to like come up with story prompts. Um, you guys can definitely look at generators. Um, I know uh, NaNoWriMo for the Yun Writers Program has a story generator and it comes up with these really crazy, crazy ideas. And it's sometimes it's fun just to kind of look and see what happens. Um, if you guys want, if you feel like you wanna give it a shot, we can definitely brainstorm a couple ideas as a group or we can save that for later, okay? Just let me know what you fe are feeling. Okay, we could get back to that. All right, so once you come up with, with like your amazing idea, you wanna make sure that you have characters to support it. So let's, for argument's sake, let's do, since it's a rainy day, let's have our amazing idea deal with one of these crazy, with the crazy weather, right? And we're having crazy weather and, sorry about that. Um, we're gonna deal with, it's, people stuck in a grocery store during a crazy rainstorm is our idea. It's not the strongest idea, but we'll make it bigger, right? But we need some people to populate this idea. This is the, after the idea you wanna come up with your characters to help support it. You need to have your main character, definitely, and their opposing force, um, their antagonist or depending on what you're writing, the secondary protagonist or the main character. Certain things that we want to know right out of the gate to help us. It's almost like one of those dating profiles, almost. You wanna know their name, their demographics, like their age, their, uh, their gender, their location, um, their orientation, things like that. Cause that's gonna help inform some of their, their core values, their ideals, their beliefs, things that make up the person and make them individual. Um, you wanna know about their family history, if that comes into play. Are they an only child? Do they have a large family? Um, did they grow up in an orphanage? Things like that. Um, what do they do for their, for their life? Are they a student? Are they a CEO of a internet startup, because those are gonna be two totally different perspectives too. And again, this kind of fuels everything. Can I ask a question? Yes. This is Mina. Um, so if you're doing all of this, how do you keep track of all of the details? Like what are some of the tools to keep track of like this and your plot? Right, so um, there's a lot of different ways. I like to do my pre-writing on paper. I feel like it gives me a little more room to wiggle around and doesn't make it feel as set in stone. So I end up using, sometimes if I'm just brainstorming, I'll just write in a notebook. Um, trying to get it all out. I use index cards when I'm plotting plot points. Um, I use character profiles, like the one Mina just hand handed out to you to work on character work. Um, I've used those forever and ever and ever. Um, 
I find those really helpful and they can be as simple or as complex as I need them to be. Um, and then I eventually, I, if I don't do it right away, I do put it all in one cohesive notebook um, called a story Bible. Um, let's see if I have one nearby. I may, I may not. Um, since I'm in between projects right now, I may not, but let's see. So a story Bible for me, depending on what it is, um, will be something like this kind of notebook. And I will have tabs set up in it for character, plot, setting, um, research questions, and things I need to do. Um, like my... my my publishing tasks since I am, uh, I do do my own publishing. Um, I make sure I have enough pages in each section so that way I can always go and add additional stuff if I need to. I'm a huge fan of disc bound notebooks for that purpose because I can just pull off a piece of paper from one section and move it into another section if I need to. Um, I don't, I, they're pretty utilitarian in my design of them. I keep them pretty straightforward. I know other writers like to decorate them with stickers and color and all that. Um, and if I do that, that would just be me if I'm spinning my wheels and I need something to do. Um, does that answer your question, Mina? I think that would answer that. Yes, it does. I, the reason I was asking is because some authors, you know, like they end up having these long series and hopefully you'll be one of them. And I just wondered if they start off plotting all of that at the beginning or they, you know, it sort of evolves as they get more, um, more uh, books. It does. And I'll go off screen for one second. Sorry. I'm sorry. One minute, just so I can show you guys <laughs> one of them. I love her uh, Harry Potter uh, bookshelf. <laughs> Mina, did you want to share my table? Oh, no, I'm probably going to be quiet after this. <laughs> <laughs> no, great questions. Keep them coming. Right, thanks. <laughs> I'll just stay in the corner now. <laughs> so this is one plus side of having a small apartment is everything's within hands reach, right? So this is my story Bible for my um, debut novel, Scavenger Night, which I decided to push out at the, at the middle of lockdown last year. Um, its title is entirely different now. Um, it was called Scenes from Last Night, and then it just morphed because titles are never permanent. Um, they tend to have like, you, you tend to use code names or whatever else. And I had made a cover for my Bible and I have, I don't know if you guys can see it rather, yeah. <laughs> but I have like my notes for my scavenger hunt items, my like revision task list up in front. And then I have my pages, my handwritten pages for my characters. And it's really just me writing out a whole bunch of stuff my setting notes, I have like little pictures that I had printed out from my Pinterest board for it. Um, and then if I do a second book in that, if I do a companion piece, which is the intent, um, I'll come back to this and pull and add additional notes to it um, and build onto it for my second book for that series. Um, my, my fantasy that's coming out in April is in a much bigger, messier notebook. Um, then I do have a digital version too, because sometimes things do crop up on the go. So I do have like a, a file, a, like a file digitally through Google to keep notes to myself if I'm not texting myself notes or emailing myself notes. Um, I do have attention deficit disorder. So some of my stuff is not the most organized at times. 
Um, but I still know where things are. So I think that is good. Um, one thing when you're creating your characters, you want to make sure you ask the following questions because this is going to help form your plot. What is your character's biggest want? Um, like it can be that Susie wants to be the prom queen. That's like her biggest want, uh, but then there's also something that is fueling that that's more hidden that she doesn't really know, but you need to know. Like she wants to be the prom queen because her mother was never able to make it to the be prom queen and she wants to make her mother proud. So then that kind of adds to that story and that conflict. What is their biggest secret? What is the thing that they're keeping to themselves that no one else knows, right? So if we go back to Susie and her prom queen, maybe her biggest secret is that she really is not into being prom queen. She has no use for any of the kind of superficialness as she views it. And she would much rather be able to play on the boys ice hockey team, mm -hmm. right? That the, so those are two things that can be at odds at each other. And what is her biggest fear? Like if, what is like the worst thing that can happen to her? Not like she's afraid of spiders, but like if her, like, what's it would have to be for her the equivalent of if this comes out the world blows up so her biggest fear can be that she will never be accepted for the person she wants to be if she that comes out her world will blow up if, type thing like if perhaps her mother is not um a fan uh, maybe her mother is somebody who is all about girls need to do girl things so that playing on the boys ice hockey team would really not fit that expectation of her mom. Is this, does that make sense to everybody? I have Do a you, question. Yeah. Can these um, questions, like the biggest fear, the biggest want, secret, et cetera, can all that come, does it have to be like a preset piece of the character or can it come about based on the plot of your novel? Because um, the, the novel that I have in mind that's already outlined, um, the character is kidnapped. So like her biggest fear would be never getting away. Her biggest secret would be like, she actually kind of likes some of her kidnappers. Um, her biggest want would be to get home. Right. Or would I have to... Yeah. So she wouldn't have that before she's kidnapped in the book. Right. But I bet you she had something and they can change over time. So like it can also develop during the course. You need to have some kind of idea of when at the start of the novel where you're writing, that's like, you know, the normal world. Everything is hunky dory. They go about their 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 day and nothing's out of the ordinary. Think of Lord of the Rings, right? Frodo is living his best Frodo life with his eccentric uncle. They're friends with the, the wizard Gandalf, who sometimes is questionable, sometimes is not. Everything is going great in Frodo's world. And then what happens? Right? All of a sudden, the ring. Bilbo disappears is the, and then the ring it becomes key. So all of Bilbo's beliefs in his status quo of his life changes with that. And that we'll get into that more in the plot section, but that's like the catalyst, the inciting incident to get the story started. So you need to have a rough idea. You don't need to spend too much time on it, but you do need to have a little bit of this is what life's like before all the craziness happens. So you have to have some kind of snapshot. And while you're writing, you will probably come up with some of this, like, you know, like 
your character may have been like a pinball champion and that you didn't know that until you're halfway through the novel. That's what's great about revision. Then later you can kind of fix that um, and kind of give, if that has any credence to your novel, work it in. Um, but you want to be able to know these things, those three things, um, even if it's not out on paper, you need to know it while you're writing in some form. Like it sounds like you already have the idea, you know, like the secret, the want and the fear, like you have it there. So that's good. They may not put voice to it, but you need to know it so you can work it in. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Does anyone else have any questions? No, nope, all quiet here. Okay. So Mina did hand out what I use as a character profile sheet. Um, it is in my book that just came out in September. You can also get it, um, download additional copies for, of that from my website, aliciagregoire.com under the resources page. And of course, you know, you might like, depending on the story, there may be other things you need to add in there too. Um, every story is different. So every pre-writing process is going to have some variation to it. All right. So now we're getting into the plotting of the novel, um, knowing the main things that happen in your story. Now, some people like to plot literally every single thing and know exactly what is happening at every given time. Other people are like, I know how it's ending and I'm good. Um, there's people who don't even know that, they just kind of go at it with a blank screen or a blank page and just write whatever comes to their head. Like they have the little idea and then they're, they're, on, they're on their way running. Some people are a little bit of both, and I'm one of those in-between people. I like my characters kind of dictating what happens, but I also like knowing where I need to go in case I get stuck. And this is why plot structure is your friend. Um, there are totally different types of plot structures. You, depending on how long you've been in the writing, industry, you've heard of Blake Snyder's beat sheets from Save, Save the Cat. You've heard of the three-act structure, the hero's journey. Uh, there's so many. If you Google it, you'll see an insane amount of things. Um, but they all have similarities, regardless of how it's being dressed. Um, so at the minimum, these are the things you need to know, regardless of what plot, what plot structure calls it. You need to know where the story starts. Not like if we went back to Lord of the Rings, that would be Frodo living his best hobbit life. That's where the story starts. They're having the celebration for Bilbo. They are getting all of that stuff together. That's the start of the story. Then the first turning point where it's, uh, things can't go back to normal now. Bilbo disappears, Gandalf appears in the house and tells Frodo he needs to keep the ring secret and safe and Bilbo runs away, but Frodo runs away, right? He runs off with his friends to get this taken care of. These are the things that kick the story in action. Things cannot go back to the way they are because of these things. That's the first turning point. Then you need to know the big major moment, like where it's the climax of the story, the big major moment. So that would be in Lord of the Rings, I'm trying to remember the movies all blur in my head as do the books. I'm going to say when Gandalf is beaten by the Balrog when he falls down. That's a pretty, it's a pretty, I may be wrong, but that's my opinion. Things don't, things definitely are pretty bleak at that moment. 
Um, they had to go through all the tunnels. Now they lost one of their own. Everybody's feeling kind of crappy, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, that, that it changes the tone of the story. And then the second turning point, now you're on the down part, you're down over here. And this is like where they kind of rally back together and get themselves going to where they need to be before the end. And somebody needs to remind me because I can't remember about how that goes. I'm looking it up right now, sorry. Remember the they end that. <laughs> I don't think I saw all three movies. They're all kind of blending. If you asked me about Harry Potter, I would totally know this answer. <laughs> I should have done Harry Potter because I live Harry Potter, but for some reason my brain was like, we're gonna discuss Lord of the Rings. <laughs> um, it's like to switch. It's not because you know Dumbledore did. Oh, did you all read it? You all know. So Dumbledore, <laughs> you know fell off the, the tower, just like Gandalf. So it's sort of like, you know. So we're gonna switch gears. We'll go through the first Harry Potter book where the story starts. Harry is living his, is existing in his Harry Potter life. He has. <laughs> <laughs> he has his small cupboard with the spiders and his abusive, relatives and this is life then something happens right he goes to the zoo yeah he goes well he goes to the zoo this is the start of it turn no turning back he gets the goes to the zoo and releases the snake and then the owls come and come and follow them everywhere the, the Dursleys have to flee. Finally, Hagrid shows up and now we can't go back. Dudley has a tail. Hagrid has a motorcycle. <laughs> they, they're on their way. Like Harry is on his way, right? And that's the first turning point. He can't go back after that. He, go, he is now in the wizarding world, right? Yeah. <laughs> And then it just slowly builds up from there, right? We yeah. all know the story. He goes up, you know. There's, there's the, there's like the, the things that are happening. People are, like all of them are blending in. I'm trying to decide if I want to just do <laughs> the first one or all seven. But we'll just do all seven. Like Mina said, you know, Dumbledore falling is also like one of those things that ends. We take the whole the whole seven books into account. The second turning point would be somewhere in book seven. Can somebody help me? It's been a while. We've done a lot of book one in my house lately. Would it be the um, the battle at Hogwarts? Yes, yes, you're right. It would be the battle of Hogwarts. Thank you, thank you for being my audience plant. Um, <laughs> I'll get paid later. <laughs> yes, you will. Um, yeah, and then, you know, there's really no turning back at that point. Like, you're now at the end. Things are going going forward. Everything has changed. The characters have changed. I mean, of course, they've changed. It's been seven years, right? But, they're, like, truths have been changed. It, I mean, at the end, end in that epilogue, I mean, they're adults, like, they're shot like we learn about Siri. We we learned that Snape wasn't an butt the whole entire time. He was just <laughs> bitter about love and like Harry's feelings towards him change. So all of that comes in. And then at when the story ends, we know where everyone is standing. And then they go into their new normal, like we are right now with COVID. Um, we're in our new normal. So here, they're all in their new normal. And then if we have a new story, like when we did, they did the play, 
it all starts all over again, right? The the offs the the Harry's kids and everyone are in their new norm, their normal, and then it starts all over again. I know that was really convoluted. I'm still working on my copy. Um, so I'm apologizing for that right now. Does anyone have any questions? No, no. Okay. So if you know those five things at most, at minimum, you'll be good. And it's not like, as you can see from my ramblings, it's not just like one little scene. It takes, it's multiple, it sometimes is multiple scenes and multiple events that happen that make up that one point, which is good because you can figure out a lot of stuff that way. So take some time if you haven't already in the next day and a half, um, asking yourself those questions. If, if you're somebody who just thinking of that is kind of stressing you out, I definitely recommend just free writing. There is a program called Write or Die online. It's free. I use it an awful lot. Um, and there is a, it, there's different versions of it within the website where you can have it. It's basically you write, or it's going to make an alarm or you're going to write, or if you don't, it's going to eat your words. Um, so the <laughs> basis behind it is just to write out, write and write and write and not stop. It doesn't care if you're writing the same word over and over and over again just wants you to write. And I will tell you that if you write one word over and over and over again, my preferred word is not suitable for Zoom. Um, eventually, something will eventually get shaken out of your brain and you'll find that you are able to write out everything that has been blocked up. Um, so write or die is your friend, it's my friend. I'll be seeing it later on this afternoon. Um, since I'm still needing to plot my novel too. Um, but yeah, it's like, even it's like you need to know those five questions and you need to know your main character and the person who is up against their main character to start out in terms of story and the idea, of course. But you have that, you have the foundations for NaNoWriMo. Don't get you don't want to get bogged down in minutia to the point where you're like, I can't write because I don't know this mailman's name or I can't write because I don't know what they're eating. I love to use placeholders. Um, I typically type, um, though the last couple of years I've been doing lawn hand. Um, because I've been getting so distracted. But whenever I don't know what I need to put in there, I will put it in bold and caps and bracket it off like mailman number one, or they're going to be eating at some kind of restaurant here, make up some really disgusting food, or some note to myself. So when I go back and revise it in a few months' time, I have the idea of what it was I wanted to do. And then I can spend my time thinking it through because you want to be able to have your draft done by the end of November in whatever shape it is. I typically call my NaNoWriMo drafts my Mad Lib drafts because of the fact I have all of those placeholders in there for characters that are not named yet, for things that, for like, things that they've said that I don't know. My fantasy novel has a lot of spell work in it. So if I don't know what word they're gonna say or what kind of spell it is. I'll just put spell here and figure it out in the back end. Um, Cause if you're especially at a good clip you don't wanna stall that by overthinking something. Um, as a chronic overthinker, it kind of can derail your mojo. All right, now one big thing is trying to find the time to write. 
every because it's a lot of words. They break it down to 1,667 words a day, um, which is about three pages of eight and a half by 11. But it's still, if you're not used to writing every day, it can be hard, right? So we're gonna kind of look, go over how the best way to find out, finding the time to write and to figure out how many days you guys have to write. So if you have your phone or if you wanna just do a quick draw of a calendar on a piece of paper, go at it um, and we can kind of dive into this. And then after we can go into like talking into some tips and tricks and talking about and have some questions and answers. Sound good? Yep. All right. All right, so you wanna know your, the place that you're, you, the way you work best um, for those times when you're writing. Um, if you know your ideal situation, you can then find pieces of it and put it in your everyday. Um, like, do you like to have a lot of natural light? Are you somebody who wants to work in a cave? Do you want to have like music playing or do you need it to be like white noise machine everywhere? Um, ask yourself where you are the most productive in terms of writing. Like where do you find that you get your most writing work done? And where do you find that you're most focused during your day? you know those things you could kind of figure out. For me, I've been finding I'm more focused and fresher in the morning than I mean in the morning um, before the day has come at me because nothing else is going on in my gray matter. It's just me and the computer or the paper and whatever noise is going on wherever I am. All summer long, I was working, I would go I get up at three, I would actually go and park outside of the gym I would go attend and use their Wi-Fi and work until my appointment. Um, and it worked for me. I got a lot of stuff done. Working at, at the end of the day for me can happen, but it's harder because I'm on all day. I do my day job. I have a kid. I'm up at 3 a.m., um, I have to wrangle my kid. By the time my kid is asleep, it's almost time for me to go to sleep. So I'll write like three words and be done. Um, I like to have, I like to have like minimal distractions. I will put my headphones on, even if there's nothing coming out of it, just to mute the ambient noise. If I'm working in our house, um, I like to have like a clean workspace, um, those kinds of things. What kind of things do you guys find work best for you just in your day-to-day? -day? Have Do you have any thoughts on that? Are there very many other writers in the room who have started writing yet? Or are we newbies? Or even, or just like if you're doing something outside of your regular day job or even your day job, what what helps you get your work done. I have to do my writing first before I do anything else, before I tackle my, my day job as well. Or I have to do it um, like after, after the day is ended, you know, when everybody else goes to bed. So I'm not a three, I, <laughs> I am not a 3 a.m. get up and write person, but I, you know, I'll do stretches where I'll write from nine to 11 p.m. Or um, because I don't go into work every day, I'll write from nine to 11 a.m. So like the nine to 11 window is mine. That was a really good question. Um, are you all just starting or is anybody um, bit, like have a work in progress? Okay, so it sounds to me like Alicia, we're we're sort of like you know just uh, getting uh, advice from you about how to get started. Perfect. So, um, in that case, like 
I'll just tailor it to how I know if like for work, for my day-to-day -day job that I work, work 10 hours a day for, I know if I like, I can sometimes tell if I'm going to have an ADD day or not. So if I have that, I'll put on some like um, ADHD, like designed music and listen to it in my headphones and screw around on a cell phone game for about 10 minutes. And then something will click in my brain and then I can go and focus on my day job. But again, I need to have something to drink with me. I need to have my desk set up the correct way. These little things that you notice you do for, for your job that like help you be your best productive self, those things will also translate over to helping you write. So if you're somebody who likes to, who works better at say a library or a coffee shop, definitely try to work those into your day-to-day -day as much as you can. Um, and since you guys are all new to this, I mean, definitely be kind to yourself. It's going to be a lot of trial and error and exploring about yourself this month, this upcoming month. And that's also a good thing too, right? But you definitely need to make sure you have the time to write. Um, because, and nobody's going to make the time for you except for you. So you need to make sure you communicate to people when you're writing. You need to make sure you have, you know what days are going to basically be dead writing days. A lot, for a lot of people, Thanksgiving is a dead writing day, right? You're, it's either because you're traveling for Thanksgiving, you're prepping for that, you're making the meal, you're going to a football game, something. You're doing something that's going to eat your day. Um, since I wake up at 3 a.m., I don't really need to worry about that so much, but um, definitely take a look at your calendar when you get home, if you don't do it now, and see what days are just, are just not going to compute, right? So for me, it tends to be, the end of November tends to be dicey. Uh, we have Thanksgiving. Um, my husband's birthday is right after Thanksgiving. So we're usually away at my in-laws for that entire weekend. Um, I will calculate that as dead writing. And if I get it in, I get it in. And that's just, you know, padding for me. That's just, you know, extra writing. But I don't calculate that I'll get stuff done. And then if I do, I get happy. <laughs> right. And then after the days you have left, you count how many of those are, and then you divide that with the 50,000 to figure out what your writing goal is per day. Now, do you need to write that chunk of words all in one sitting? Definitely not. You might be somebody who works better in small, short bursts. You might be able to do like 20 minutes in the morning. You might take your lunch break and write, and then you might finish the rest of it in the evening. Um, do what works for you. There's no wrong or right way to do this. Um, but make sure you block out where you're going to write. And then you let people know, hey, this is my writing time. I need to get this work done. Please don't bother me between this time and this time. Um, if you have kids, it might be a little more tricky depending on their age. Um, my daughter's a little more, my daughter's five. And since the pandemic, you know, she's a little more used to knowing if I'm in front of the computer, I'm typically working. If I have my headphones on, I'm typically not to be disturbed. Um, but that's for my day job. She knows since I have two computers, one for work, one for writing, she knows if I'm using the one for writing, we consider it my fun work. Mm -hmm. And she knows that she can actually come up and talk to me or whatnot. Um, but she also knows that she needs to let me work too. So if you have kids, you might wanna consider them doing a lot more screen time in November. Um, just saying, it's a thing. If you have kids that do homework and you're home when they're doing their homework, make 
their homework time, your writing time. That way you guys are doing work together. Um, my daughter doesn't have homework, but she will do her fun work, as she calls it, while I do mine. So she will sit there and play games on her tablet. And for her, and so that way she's also part of part of the writing. She feels like she's being helpful. Um, so I don't know if you guys have kids, but these are things that I've noticed that have worked in the last year with her as she's gotten a little more savvy to what's going on. Um, and that way she feels like she's being, she's being involved. Um, if you have any significant others, I know it can be kind of hard. Um, I'm fortunate. My husband is pretty lax on like demanding because he knows this is my thing. Um, Pre-child, I would work in the living room while he'd be watching TV just so we could be in the same space. Um, even now we're kind of doing that where the desk, it, the office space for me is next to the living room. So he'll still be like hanging out there and I'll be here and he'll know if he can talk to me or not. And if I'm mid thought, I will tell him he needs to wait until that's done. Um, so definitely communicate with the people you live with, your loved ones. Hey, I'm busy this time. Hey, I'm working. Oh, you need something for me? Well, you need to wait until this part is done. Um, if you communicate, it will make it easier for the people around you. Does anyone have any questions about like blocking out time or finding the time so far? Because I know that can be a big piece. I don't see any. Oh, go ahead, Holly. It, it's a little about blocking out time and a little about the previous section. Have you ever used like a speech to text um, software? Because that frees up like you can you you can speak your story while like you're driving to work or while you're doing something else, um, you know, while you're getting exercise or out and about. And it also, for me at least, it takes out the fact that I have to figure, I have to remember how to spell. I have to remember how to form the letters if I'm long writing. And it takes out a lot of that consciousness of making my handwriting legible um, in order to actually get my thoughts out. Right. And I, I'm trying to teach myself how to do dictation because, you know, it would be useful for me to be able to like work on my novel while I go for a walk or if I'm like in a longer drive by myself to be able to do that. Um, I know a lot of people, a lot of authors that do do that. Um, one of my um, accountability partners, um, Natasha Sass does that. She'll she uses Dragon to do all of her dictating, and then she re revises it, and it works really well for her. Um, I there is I've heard there is a bit of if you're not used to it, you do need to get acclimated to it. There are books out there on how to do novel dictation, so you can get it taken care of. Um, I have a voice to text um, app on my phone. So that way, if I do have thoughts, I can just quickly say them out because sometimes the words just don't come out of my fingers. Um, when I do write and I do write longhand, I do a lot of abbreviations because um, I have to then go put it in the computer, type it all up. So I'm fine if I have abbreviations in some really atrocious spelling and atrocious handwriting because it's gonna get taken care of during the typing. Um, yeah, so I'm just trying to transition all of the skills that I taught myself when I was in college, trying yeah. to write papers, I'm trying to transition those over. And I think that's a great thing. Um, and you could definitely, the dictation is definitely a good thing you could get your words done very fast if you're if you're able to do that. Um, and if it works for you, it works for you. Most of my presentation is based off of how I, my processes and how my experiences and what works for me. But definitely you wanna make sure you know your strengths and weaknesses and you play to your strengths during your draft, your fast drafting your and NaNoWriMo. It's only gonna help you. Um, you know, don't get too stressed. A lot of people kind of have it locked in their head that, you know, oh, I need to win. And I'm 
just as guilty of, of that. But think of it this way. No, even if you don't make the 50,000 words, I want you guys to hear this. Even if you don't make the 50,000 word win by November 30th, you've still won in that you've started something. You started writing a novel. You started to challenge yourself. Not everybody does this. Um, you know, you started it. it. That's the main thing. And you'll find out if it's for you or not. And even if it takes you all year to work on it and complete it, that's okay, especially if this is your first time. Writing a novel is hard. Erin can definitely confirm that. She's had about the same amount of experience as I have, um, probably more, more books under her belt for sure. Um, you know, it, it's hard to get to get all that managed first time out. My first novel was atrocious. Um, I was much younger than I am now, but it was atrocious. And it's okay if it's crappy and you want it to be crappy. You're writing a first draft and that first draft needs to be yours and for nobody else. Erin says it's super hard and it's still hard and she has nine novels under her belt. Um, it's a process and what makes it wacky is that no two books get written the same exact way. What worked for you today may not work for you tomorrow. It's a lot of trial and error and a lot of how does this work for me and how do I work? Um, if you're somebody who's still trying to figure out a lot of that stuff, like I am, you're going to be surprised and find things, you're going to find strengths that you have and strengths that you don't have. Um, and that's okay. Just remember, all words are good words. It doesn't have to be perfect. And November is for you in your story. Nobody else is going to see it except you. You're telling yourself the story. Okay, those are the important things to remember. Any other questions so far? Um, Alicia, we're at about an hour. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, if you guys have any you know, questions, feel free to bring them up. If not, um, I'm gonna say that we're gonna keep this room open for you to write for until two o'clock. So you're welcome to just stay and write in a quiet place um, where no kids are running around and no, um, well, kids are running around, but, <laughs> but where it's relatively quiet and you can, you don't even have to stay in this room. You can stay anywhere in the library, study room, uh, the reference area, the, you know, whatever works for you. So it starts off our month of writing. Um, so sorry, I didn't wanna. No, that's ahead. fine. Just a quick tip too. Um, it's kind of, kind of like a reminder too. Like you don't, if you think I have no time to write, but if you're like, I have five minutes before I have to be somewhere, let me go check and see what's going on in Instagram. Guess what? That was five minutes you could have written. I'm so mm -hmm. guilty of this. So definitely think about the things you waste your time on when you're like, have five minutes. And you can use that to like do a brainstorm or something or write a snippet, a dialogue. Um, if you want, if you're concerned about getting your words in, you could definitely do that. Um, there's focus apps that you can put on your phone, on your computer to limit these things. Um, I'm a huge fan of Forest um, for that reason, um, which is um, a Chrome add-on and it's also a phone app. Yeah, and then make sure you have whatever you're, if you're using, if you're typing, find something that you can do on the go, like Google Sheet, um, Google Google Docs, um, something that you can keep in the cloud so you can access it from wherever you are if you want to write on your lunch break at the office, if you want to write in the parking lot at in the school pickup line, something that you can do in those, those small slots. And that's it. Um, any questions or anything? Any other questions? Wow, you guys are quiet. Um, <laughs> I do want to say that um, Aaron, who is here listening in, um, Aaron Dion is going to do our next program um, on Friday at 1 p.m. She's going to be talking about characters, creating characters that move your plot forward. And um, so that'll be really interesting, I think, too, to help us 
in the second part of our what was it that was the second part right like the first part is yeah yeah i was listening <laughs> can't wait it's gonna be fun yeah i'm looking forward to it Erin. thank you so much for doing this um alicia thank you so much this has been really awesome i think right and um i've learned a lot i know that um now i feel like writing something I don't, i'm not even a writer <laughs> you could be oh anybody could be right i mean November's I, right around the corner mina um, <laughs> i do appreciate you guys taking time out today to chat with me. Um, I'm available online. You can find me on Instagram or any socials, um, most socials using um, Alicia Gregoire um, as my handle. Um, my website is aliciagregoire.com. My links are there and you can definitely outreach to me if you have any questions. I'm more than happy to help. Um, any question? Any other questions or anything you need before before we adjourn? Adjourn? We're not that. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much, Alicia. This was super fun. Thanks, Erin. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you for making this happen. I know that you had uh, some stuff that came up, so I appreciate you uh, taking the time, even though you have stuff in the background going happening. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much for accommodating that. I really wish I was there in person. I know. <laughs> I do too. Then you can stay and write with us. I, if you keep the channel open, I might do that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. We don't have to stop. Do you guys want to spend some time writing and chatting with Alicia? Yeah, I heard a shirt. <laughs> Excellent. You might see, you might see a five-year-old, but but yeah, this is great. Thank awesome. you so much. Yeah, so feel free to stay and chat, uh, write or start writing. And um, Alicia will be here writing as well and being able to answer any questions that come up as you uh, get started. Definitely. Thank you. I have a question, Alicia. Yeah. Um, before my mom passed, I went out and visited her for a week and took my video camera and we did nine hours of her life story. And that may be the first project that I worked on at some point. Um, do you have resources for how to do like a memoir or? Um, I don't. Um, I haven't done any memoir writing since I was in college. Um, I don't know if Erin is still here, if she knows, popped off, but I could definitely take a quick peek and see if I can find something. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. So there, there's a, uh, so I just wrote, I just went into Google and typed memoir writing help and got a whole bunch of like pretty solid hits back. Okay. Um, sorry, my computer decided to act up. Um, that's fine. I can do that too. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, we'll Okay, I have another question for you. Um, let's say you're writing for adolescents or young adults. Are there guidelines somewhere for uh, boundaries around that and what lines you don't cross? Or oh, we lost your audio, hun. Oh, you're muted. Are you thinking of what age group for young adult are you thinking? Because there's like the older young adults, which is more of like 
like 17 and older, and then there's the younger subset. Maybe the younger. So the younger subset, like I would keep it, you know, if you're going to do any between the sheets action, you know, definitely fade it to black. Um, you know, you try not to make stuff too graphic in the like intimacy department. Um, it's YA is so it's polarizing because there's so like there's so many topics that are covered and so many people depending on where they're located are like it needs to be you know super duper like chaste and clean and squeaky no no swearing no taboo subjects but that's what the kids want and like I'm somebody who is definitely believes kids can censor their own material in terms of books if they don't understand it their brain's just going to kind of gloss over it um until they're ready to address it and i'm somebody who was never prohibited from reading any type of books i was reading stephen king when i was in middle school and let's be honest we really shouldn't be reading most stephen king in middle mm -hmm. school um you know, but that like, I mean, think about banned books week and the books that are banned all the time. I mean, Harry Potter's banned for witchcraft and um, a lot of classics are banned for like super like, like just things that were more common back then. So I would say when you're, when you're writing your story the first time you write the story as how you need it to be not worry as much about what they say like that's what you worry about more when you're revising it mm -hmm. um you don't want to curtail your creativity while you're drafting because it's going to make it harder right a lot of my first drafts regardless of genre are apt like there's stuff in there that should not be in there and then I just edit it out because it needs mm -hmm. to be done so that way I can see where it's going um because again the first draft is for you um but there are some there is definitely things that you know like on both sides of the fence on what is appropriate and what is not if you are serious if you're seriously considering like doing YA as your genre um and making that your thing um you could definitely check out the S SCBWI Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators um they have workshops they have a whole bunch of different things um Mary Cole, who it used to be a literary agent um, for young adult, she had she does a workshop on Kidlet, and she has a blog, I think, still. Jennifer Loughran, 